views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forums. I'm Darren Jaime and we thank you for joining us. Yes, today's show is a forum discussion that discusses the racial inequities that many people are facing as of present. We're also going to talk about multiple points of view from multiple different perspectives from different people who want to talk about civic engagement as well as civic responsibility. So stay tuned because the Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forum show starts right now. Well, across America, many people are continuing to recover from the coronavirus pandemic and the effect that it's having, particularly in communities of color. Many people are still dealing with the challenges of racism. Protests are continuing to amass across America as America responds to the death of George Floyd. Well, in an effort to tackle some of these issues, the New York Urban League always sets its sights on dealing with racial inequity as well as equality. And guess what? Part of that discussion also includes talking about education, economic self-reliance, as well as equal respect of civil rights through programs, services, and advocacy. We're pleased now to be joined by the CEO and the president of the New York Urban League, Ms. Arbor Rice, who joins us now. And Arbor, we thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And so let's get right at it. When we talk about uh, where we are today, obviously, uh, New York is still in this state of unrest. The nation is still in a state of, state of unrest. We've got uh, civil disobedience and peaceful protesting. I'll ask you the question first and foremost, what makes this protest and this situation just a little bit more different? Mm -hmm. This moment in time is different for a couple of different reasons. Um, first of all, uh, we are just experiencing COVID. And so even if you were an essential worker, when you came home at the end of your um, hours on the job, you did not have a movie to go to. You could not go out to dinner. You could not even go visit a lot of the different relatives and family members. So as a result, you had a focus on the video that showed George Floyd it, and us watching it in a way that we have never had before. So it was a moment in time that we all shared. So that was the first thing that marked this moment as being um, very different. Um, so it, this was a, a moment where we had to look at our original disease. So we were already dealing with COVID, but then we had to look at the original disease of racism. The second thing that makes this moment in time um, very different is because we had people who were ready to take advantage of it. The fact is that particularly in New York State that we have the majority in the Senate and that we also had the majority in the assembly that you had on Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins and that you had Carl Hasties that you were able to put together legislation much of that legislation that had already been talked about already been penned already been inked and was basically sitting in a drawer in the drawers of other legislators they were able to pull it out and say yes we believe that chokehold chokehold should be illegal and we wrote this legislation after Eric Garner and we were never able to get it passed so here it is let's consider Consider it right now. We've always thought that 50A was a law that needed to be abolished. We had the legislation here. Let's make it, make it a part of this conversation. And so you had a group of uh, individuals who were ready to take advantage of this moment. And then also you have the political will. The people who are marching, who are taking their times, um, being on the streets, that does make a difference. That does help um, to push the, the public discord. So I think it's the combination of those three things. The fact that we had nothing to focus on but the fact that that uh, there was this man who had been um, literally murdered in real time on video camera and could not be denied, followed by two other killings, then having the people being pre prepared and the, and the um, political outcry. Yeah, and, and when we talk about this, I mean, we talk about the fact that George Floyd becomes the, the really this new poster child for police brutality, but we've seen it before. We've heard the echoes before. I wanna talk a little bit about not just the George Floyd incident, because when we talk about people being on the street, I think that there's a sentiment that people think that they're just protesting uh, George Floyd. It's more than George Floyd. It is really about uh, systemic injustice that has affected the African-American community for far too long. Talk to us a little 
little bit about the imbalance of the criminal justice system, because we're talking not just about police brutality, but we're also talking about a reform in the criminal justice system altogether. Mm -hmm. I think that you, your question hit the issue uh, directly on the head. And the fact is, is that, you know, we're not just marching for George Floyd. We're marching for Emmett Till, right? Um, we're marching right. for Sean Bell. You're marching for Yousef Hawkins. And this is a long tradition of being um, treated as not having our lives matter. And so this moment in time, Black Lives Matter is built on every movement beforehand. And so for a group of white people who has since early in their childhood been told that talking about race is impolite, that the best thing to do is to be colorblind, they're finally having to look in the face and say that if, you, if you're colorblind, you are not seeing me. And so if you don't see color, you're not seeing the discrimination and the racism that has been in belt, that has been built into this system. And you saw Governor Cuomo say, you all have won. We have put together this, this terrific slate of legislation. And so you don't need to march anymore. And the protesters have come back and said, you know, like you said, this is not just about this one person who passed or even the three people that have come to light. Now we have the person who was just um, killed in, in Georgia as well, but this is about racism as an institution, and it is a referendum on racism. When we look and we talk about racism as an institution, we know that one of the things that happened during the 60s was that of Black people being hung, uh, and we know that that was real. Um, we're hearing stories now, California, multiple people being found hung uh, with the end result suicide. Give me your thoughts on, on what we're hearing and, and, and what that takes you back to, and what can we continue to do? I have to tell you, when I heard the first story um, about the lynching in, in Texas and the it, suicide, I mean, it's, first of all, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's not how, how Black people uh, move and, and interact in the world. So the fact that you would even put that out as a, as a possible um, solution to what had happened is just ridiculous. And it is chilling absolutely chilling to think about the fact that we could be back at that place and moment in time. The NAACP was created, the, the Urban League was created during that period of time where their lynchings were a regular everyday occurrence. And so these civil rights organizations were created in order to, to count it. Um, and so the NAACP counted every single day the number of lynchings that they heard about um, in order so that we, they could count it and so that they could stop it. And so the fact that it would come back at this point in time, you know, when I have my four-year-old nephew and all the young people in the programs that we're serving and, you know, brothers and cousins and it's, it's absolutely chilling. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's systemic. We've seen this throughout the course of time. You talked about uh, the New York Urban League. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the Urban League and the work that it does, because for somebody, uh, they may not be so familiar with the work of the Urban League, but uh, I know that every year uh, we, were, we were take the report that was given and really break it down and, and be able to talk about some of the systemic things that are going on in our community. But would you share with our viewers a little bit about the work of the Urban League and the, the things that it does year round? You are absolutely so. The the urban the New York Urban League is part of a national network of urban leagues that are in over ninety communities throughout the city, and urban leagues were started over a hundred. The National Urban League was started over a hundred and ten years ago, when, as I mentioned, um, lynchings were rampant, um, and African Americans were just being terrorized in in the South, and so they made they became part of the Great Migration, moving to the North, moving into big cities, and trying to figure out how to acclimate to, to um, find places to, to send their kids to school, being able to find jobs, being able to, to find and to build communities. And so urban leagues were started in order to help those individuals who are making that great transition. And so over um, the course of the last hundred years, we have worked basically in the areas of education, employment, housing, and healthcare. And the New York Urban League's focus is particularly in education and employment. And by that, we mean education. We work with individuals in the middle school, high school, and all the way through um, helping individuals get to and through college. And so in the middle school, it's providing STEM summer camps. It's being able to provide them with after school enrichment. At the high school level, being able to provide college access. We have a huge historically black college and university fair that's at Riverbank State Park, where we have individuals who are able to apply for college and get admission on the spot and have given out over a million dollars worth of scholarships at the HBCU Fair and the annual basis. 
then we work with the, those same um, individuals who are a part of our Whitney M. Young Scholarship Initiative, where we've given out over $20 million in scholarships there. And they're paired with our young professionals. And our young professionals are individuals who give back to the Urban League in amazing and wonderful ways, volunteering over 15,000 hours of service to the community, volunteering for that fair that I mentioned, as well as for being serving as mentors and providing support in our programming. And then we also provide individuals with employment, and that is providing them with opportunities to hone and develop their job training skills, job seeking skills, work on their resumes and get placed um, in living wage employment. And then the last piece of the work that we do is in advocacy. And so when there are things that we feel like uh, African Americans are not treated treated well, uh, then that's when we, we uh, speak out and are able to uh, pull some of the levers of government in order to push for better policies and programming for African Americans. And you mentioned that State of Black America report, which is a report that our national organization re releases every spring. And it talks about um, how African Americans are doing in some key areas in housing and education, employment, civic engagement, and also uh, in, in uh, criminal justice. And so this year, the New York Urban League will re release our State of Black New York. And in the State of Black New York, we will talk about um, that will be released next month. And we'll talk about some of the inequities that uh, still, unfortunately, Unfortunately, still um, uh, permeate our system. And the theme of this year's State of Black New York is inequality is unacceptable. And there's a numbers of different points, points and places where we point to that inequality, um, but the one that is really runs through all of it is around economic inequality, which has also been the base of the Urban League's work for a long time. Um, the NAACP has worked very hard on voting rights acts initially, and then the NAACP Legal Defense Fund continues to, continues to forward that work. The NAACP works a lot on legislation um, and works very hard in order to make sure that they're advocating for African Americans. And the New York Urban League works a lot in, in uh, policy and, um, and also working in programming around economic justice issues and education. Aurora Rice is with us. She's the president and CEO of the New York Urban League and uh, talk a little bit about the work of the Urban League. I wonder if you want to, I wonder if you will, um, let's tackle this topic, right? We talk about social justice and many times when people think about social justice, the first thing that they always talk about is police brutality and, and the end of police brutality and the criminal justice system. But as you just shared, a variety of different things that we've talked about, education, uh, we talk about housing discrimination, we talk about voting, these are all things and components that are tied to social justice. Can you do uh, us some justice by giving us a little bit about what that social justice umbrella is uh, if, from your perspective? Because as we said, to me, I mean, I know a lot of people say, oh, well, gosh, they're, they're fighting for social justice and that's, that's against police brutality. I'm like, mm, you kind of got it, but you don't have it all together because it's a whole lot more than just police brutality. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, absolutely. So when we talk about um, um, social justice, it, it is criminal justice is, is part of that package, um, but it is about providing people with true equality. And so, and that's the reason why people are still marching, right? So it's it's fantastic that we put together this slate of legislation. Um, as I mentioned, that uh, Gover Governor Cuomo put the Say Their Name um, reform um, legislation into place that specifically focuses on some of the issues that we had around police brutality and around how police work with communities. But the fact is, is that if you're really talking about social justice, think of the word social, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then social justice has to do with, has a, a larger umbrella of talking about how um, African Americans are treated in education, uh, closing outcomes there. We still um, are, are, have great economic dividers. As an African American woman, you make 62 cents on a dollar. And so closing that, that income inequality, that's part of social justice, right? And so it is, it is a, a, a combination of the, of, um, um, different aspects. When it comes to housing, it's still harder for African Americans to get mortgages. Um, we still have suffer from having um, lower credit scores and higher debt, and that's a, that is uh, a result of systematic racism over the over the course of time. People say sa slavery was so many years ago, but the fact is is that Jim Crow laws were not that long ago. Um, um, uh, the more discrimination in mortgage lending was not that long ago, and then we still have to deal with the inequalities around um, uh, equal pay. And so those are things, systematic things that are still in place right now. And that's why we have to continue the fight. Yeah. And when we talk about voting, I think that's major, right? We got an election coming up in November. Uh, we've got COVID-19 that we're contending with. And there is a concern that whether or not we're going to see people really get out to vote. We know we talk about voting and 
the possibility of absentee ballots and going forward, a lot of people could possibly vote absentee. Uh, your thoughts, your concerns about this uh, upcoming election, given the fact that we're in this heightened environment? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I am very concerned um, about this upcoming election. I, I think that uh, peeling back the onion on what has just taken place with the massive move around police reform, like I said, shows you the power of voting. Because the fact is, is that if we did not have the majorities at the, at the statewide level, a lot of that marching would have been for naught because we, not, we would not have been able to pass those bills. We're really excited about the legislation that's been introduced by Senators Cory Booker, Senator Kamala Harris, um, them looking for um, justice reform. But the fact is they may be able to pass it by the House, but will they be able to pass it by the Senate? That's right. the reason why voting matters. And if there was ever a, a concrete example of why and how voting matters, it is this moment in time. And so without becoming too political, um, but I think that the, the vote that is coming up this November for the president mm -hmm. is really truly one of the most important votes, votes of our lifetime. And we always say that, we said that four years ago and four years before that, but this really is such an important and crucial vote. We saw in Wisconsin that it was a, a tough moment for people to make a d decision about their own personal health and take that risk in order to, to vote. And they stood on the lines and Wisconsin, the Wisconsinites voted. And so that is what we all need to be doing this, this um, fall. It, it does scare me a little bit because we're not sure where we're gonna be with COVID. Um, as we know, our seniors are an amazing, wonderful voting block. And that the fact is, is that they are still um, you know, commanded because of their, their health to stay home. We have to make sure that we're getting out information on absentee ballots and making sure that we have a commitment to not only vote our, ourselves, but I work with an organization called Higher Heights for America, which is dedicated to getting um, greater part political participation by African-American women. And so one of the things that they're pushing for is that not only you vote, but that you take nine people with you to the polls. Now the polls this year may be making sure that you, you turn in your absentee ballot, but we have to be dedicated not only to voting ourselves, but to making sure that we bring other people to that, to that place. Yeah, and, and getting the young people out to vote. I think that, you know, that's gonna be, that's gonna be critical too. You talked about seniors and you talked about how they're that very important voting block and absentee ballots are really going to, uh, you know, be a big be a big part of this year's election um but i want to go back to what you said a little earlier because a little earlier you did say that you know we talk about the presidential election being important four years ago um you know people said uh well you know 56 percent of eligible american voters never showed up to the polls at all four years ago 56 percent um so when we look at this year do you think that people get the message and that really people are taking action I see us taking action and taking to the streets by way of protest, but do you think by way of the voting booth that people are really getting the message? They're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> they are going yeah. to have to. I am not sure. I am not sure if this level of engagement that is um, here in New York City has thousands and thousands of people pouring onto the streets and marching and chanting in a way that uh, in my lifetime I've uh, not seen at least that intergenerationally in different different um, uh, races. And so we're going to have to take that energy into, into the polling um, boxes on uh, in November. And it is up to each of us, like I said, not only to vote as if it, our lives depended on it, and they do, but to make sure that we're taking nine other people with us. Yeah, I love how you said that. It's very politically correct. So I'm gonna go here and say, like, when we talk about going out to vote, right, uh, or even going out in this in this heightened season of protest, we're seeing numbers like never before. I think we've seen unprecedented uh, numbers in terms of white allies, white support uh, for Black Lives Matter, uh, for social justice. And in the '60s, we didn't quite see that. This year. Uh, we see a totally different trend, more white allies, more people on the, on, on the front line saying this is wrong, and I'm using white as the predominant uh, demographic uh, here, but we're seeing more. Um, why does it, why are we seeing more from your perspective in terms of that? I think it's welcome, it's needed, but, but what, what is really, do you think, is the determining factor and why we're seeing so many more people? Mm -hmm. I do think that it starts with the fact that we were all watching at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think that, or I think that to, in order to get America to look at its original disease of racism, we have to remember that it took a national, international pandemic 
in order to bring us here. <laughs> so that, I think that that's, a, that's an important fact that we have to remember. It has been a great awakening and I have gotten more phone calls from white people in the last two weeks than I probably have in the last 10 years. Um, so uh, th that has definitely been an awakening, but it is awakening that has happened because literally we had a pandemic that has, that was, you know, literally life, life stopping. We, so we had people stopping in their tracks. So that caused people to focus in, in a way that we had not seen before. Then you are seeing a person who is not struggling, even though that's, that's, that, I'm not saying that that's a, um, a good enough defense for somebody to, to say that, that um, anything else, but you had a person who was not struggling and you could count for eight minutes and 46 seconds. You had yeah. a man who called out for his mother. And everyone says that African-American women all responded because they felt like that connection of a, of a young boy calling out for his mom. I think a lot of white women felt that as well too. Yeah. And so I think yeah. that it's the particular circumstance of this death caught on film that, that battled against a lot of the, the negatives, the, the rebuttals that are sometimes put out there. They couldn't, they couldn't um, go with the rebuttals that they normally would. And we were all watching. And I think that that's what's brought this moment in time. Yeah. Arva Rice, President and CEO of the New York Urban League, our guest here. Thank you so much for taking the time of being with us. And certainly we will get people connected to the Urban League. Thanks for the great work that you're doing with Boots on the Ground. Appreciate it. And I should let people know it's www.nyul.org. All righty. Thanks a lot. We'll leave it there. Arva Rice. And listen, stay with us. We do have more show coming up. We'll be right back right after this. It looks bleak. It feels bleak. But the city isn't shut down because our public services keep working in spite of and in the face of the dangers. We can count on them. And to keep them working and funded now and in the future, we need to be counted. Self-respond now to the 2020 census at my2020census.gov. public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. Racial injustice and police brutality are a constant reminder of history repeating itself. The police involved death of George Floyd displays the structural racism in America, which is embedded in society. The protests occurring across the country give a voice to actually people about the mistreatment and the inequality and inequity in communities of color, particularly amongst African Americans, the things that African Americans face on a daily basis in today's society. Well, the question is what actions, what efforts can be further taken to give voice to others in regards to these matters, particularly racial injustice and inequalities. Joining us now to tell us a little bit more 
are the co-founders of Black Lives Create, Brianna Graham, Sierra Polite, and Doran Myrie. And we thank you all for joining us here and being with us here on the show. Thank you. So yes, much thank you. Us. Thank you so much for having us. No, it's, it's, it's important. Um, and so listen, let me uh, first give people the opportunity to know a little bit about, you know, Black Lives Create. So for somebody who doesn't know, uh, we hear about Black Lives Matter, but now Black Lives Create. So take it away and let us know a little bit about Black Lives Create. Yes, so um, Black Lives Create was a acronym that was started by one of my dear friends and um, co-producer for a show that I produce. And that show is called Working Out the Kinks. And um, when this whole George Floyd thing happened, uh, she said this acronym just came to her and um, inspired her and it's called CREATE. And so each letter has a meaning and, and each of these meanings is really a spiritual tool or not even a spiritual tool. It's more of an emotional toolkit to help uh, people of color move away from white supremacy and create a new world of change for themselves. So um, C is claim that you feel something. R is recognize the feeling. E is embrace that feeling. Um, A, address the feeling. T, take action. And E, educate and engage. And um, as we go on and, and our, our movement gets bigger, we can better articulate what each of those things mean and how they look. And, um, but for right now, we're kind of the example of how CREATE was man manifested through our emotions and not kind of knowing what to do with them, except use our tools and use our, our gifts to, to, to bring light and happiness and joy to our community when all of this is happening. So yeah, excuse me if my speech just sounds a little weird because no. I, I hear an echo, but yeah. yeah. It's a little, a little technical difficulty, but please stand by, we're good. Look, Doran, uh, give us a little bit about, uh, you guys had a peaceful protest rally um, and really exercising your right uh, and really trying to raise some awareness. So talk to us a little bit about the peaceful protest rally. Um, yeah, yeah uh, it, was, uh, it was very simple. We um, just wanted to live in that same energy from the Black Lives, Ma uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, protest that we had a week prior. Um, you know, it was a lot of positivity out there. You know, it was beautiful to see like two and three year olds walking and marching with us. Um, and, you know, watching that video of George Floyd, you know, this is not a time in history now to take our foot off the gas. Um, there's worldwide protests going on, you know, clearly for the first time, the world is n no longer ignorant to the injustice of white supremacy. And um, we had only about a week to plan this, you know, Sierra, you know, she's such an angel. She, like she just, she came to us, said, hey, you guys want to do a protest rally with me? We said we were in and um, pretty much we just gathered everyday people that we all know. Everyone has a story to tell and everyone knows what white supremacy is through their own experiences. And uh, pretty much that was what was on the stage. Um, we had performances, like musical performances. We had uh, dances. We had speeches. And um, I think we really drove the point home as far as um, taking more accountability for our everyday actions. You know, um, I've said this example before, going into a store and buying a piece of gum and simply just asking before you buy the gum, where was this company when the knee was on my neck and I couldn't breathe? You know, America as a whole was silent. So you know, we have to take more accountability and keep a better eye on our children and what they're taking in because information is a powerful thing and the wrong information is very detrimental. So really monitoring what our children are doing and um, being more active role models, encouraging them to want to uh, learn how to make money rather than be a consumer. This stuff is not taught to us in schools. You know, um, we're taught how to be uh, we're taught how to be societal workers. You know, most people go to college and I would never, I would never uh, downplay college. I went to college, I totally benefited from it, but most people also end up workers. So that tells you that there are things that they are 
omitting from the educational experience that's critical for us as a black community to move forward. Black Lives Create Movement is a platform for artists, poets, anyone with the talent to express here. themselves. And I, yeah. and I wanted to bring Sierra in and I wanted to bring Brianna back to, to this question um, because we talk about create. Um, and, and I think a lot was created after seeing the death of George Floyd. We can all yes. admit yes. a lot of things happened. But yes. I want, um, you know, Sierra, if you could take a moment and also Brianna to weigh in um, as a woman to see George Floyd and to see his life snuffed out and then to hear him call for his mother. Um, as a woman, what did that do for you? Um, it devastates me because I absolutely, hello everyone. Hi, I want hey, to introduce that. It absolutely, devil, hi guys. <laughs> it absolutely devastates me. Honestly, uh, I'm not a mother yet. I absolutely can't wait to be one. I currently volunteer at the Queensboro Correctional Facility, which is a kind of a work program or release jail. Uh, for men, and predominantly the African-American or Latino men, that I share a healing workshop with once a week. And um, I'm doing that from the heart. I'm doing that because many of my own family members have been incarcerated. And I'm doing that because I really do also emphasize with the black male plight and my own intimate relationships. I've seen it happen. I've seen the mirror of, of our people, our men being attacked and not being able to really find a place where they can really fully express and grow and not be stifled emotionally, spiritually, physically in any way. I feel like black women, right now we are the most, and it's statistically correct, that we are the most entrepreneurial and um, the most educated in the whole nation of America right now. And um, I think it's time for us to, I don't care how angry or how unloving black men are of us, I want us to teach them again how to love, how to continue to, we're going to instead of just be educationally, in, you know, in the leadership ranks, also, when it comes to being able to turn around and lift up our whole community. Yes. So it, it, it's devastating. I'm absolutely personally angry about it. And that's why I decided to create something like that. I was personally raised by my father primarily. My mom got out of jail when I was 8, 9, and then went back and forth and then stabilized around 15. She's a beautiful soul. My father was my absolute rock and is exactly why I am who I am today. It's why I made my business after. So um, our, our men are, they have the gift of young or male energy being able to create as well, being able to find structure and provide and protect and so many other gifts. And their kingship needs to be uplifted and we need to continue to fight so we can bring so much back into balance. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, uh, I'm going to ask the question about also the racial injustice. We know that racial injustice is huge. That's why Black Lives Matter uh, has really been at the forefront of really raising that. A lot of other organizations as well raising their voice about racial injustice. Um, I've been asking the question all show long about the allies, because when we look at allies, we're seeing uh, more and more rising up and saying uh, enough is beyond enough. Um, what, do you, what do you make of the fact that we are seeing more uh, allies in this particular death? <laughs> death of I absolutely love that you asked that question. I hope I didn't cut you off. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So you that you asked that question, absolutely. So um, I think it's great. I think it's great. I think it's just groupthink or human as well, um, honestly. And then there's an aspect of, of course, it being just emotionally genuine. People are absolutely tired of injustice, of suppression. We're all melding together. There's a lot of mixed generations and nationalities and people who, are, um, who want to abolish this. And that's been in existence for a long time, but it's just becoming a widespread consciousness, you know, of us wanting to force change as well as just find balance in this world. There's too much suffering and disparity. I think we're all just trying to, yeah, enlighten or just have a higher sense of intelligence um, um, in the way we treat each other. And we're also seeing that we're actually not finding the best happiness and finding gaps in our own space. Why is it that I can't achieve this or I'm still feeling depressed or imbalanced in this way or something feels unsettled? A lot of times it's, yeah, that personal experience is a microcosm of what's going on in the world. It's my true belief. Yeah. And so I'm feeling people just want to... Just, just be brave and heighten the consciousness. I think uh, it was enough people, and we were all tired of it, and it's allowing other people who may have not felt strong enough to stand up on their own for that or solidly even make a choice, and that's okay. You're all welcome. Please come. Please learn. Please support. And I, I understand that some are honestly just monitors of what's going on, and, and that's okay, too. Everyone's going to have their value. And the ones that are solidly in a stance of making change, um, I feel like this is the time that we can 
and actually make it happen. You know, collaboration, right? How can people collaborate with Black Lives Create and what do you have coming up that people can really be connected to? Yeah, so we are organizing right now a um, pretty much like a, people are donating their time to us, their services to us and to teach the community uh, things like teach like learning music or learning, you know, um, meditation or learning how to make survival food. Those types of things are, is what we're bringing together now. So um, yeah, allies, I would say for white people, especially if you want to help black people, let them in on the things that maybe they have been disenfranchised on, if you realize that, you know, so financial um, things that we might not even be aware of or have a difficult a difficulty, you know, getting to because of white supremacy. What's white supremacy? What's white supremacy? So, 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 so yeah, yeah. Allies, allies is really, really important to, you know, push past your comfort zone and not just do things for black people that make you feel comfortable and really, really think about, think about how, how you, you know, you know benefit, benefit from, from white, white supremacy. supremacy. So, um, so that's what we're doing next, and we'll have more information on that, and that's we'll send it over to you. That's okay. Yes, I'd like to add yeah. that. And Doran, um, let me ju- let me jump on youth activism real quick. That's Talk okay. to me about really youth, exciting. and you know, I mean, you guys are you know youthful and, and exuberant about and passionate, uh, but youth activism is huge. It's driving what we're seeing across the country. Um, how do you step up youth activism here in our area? Um. You know, it's I, it's simple. I think everyone has a talent, and you know, you know, everyone has everyone's good in something. So it's about saying I will no longer be pimped. It's about saying I'll no longer be pimped by the system. I'll bring my talent in amongst my community where it's appreciated, and I will start donating my time to helping people. And you know, by helping genuinely helping people, you naturally get contacts, you naturally start to get business, you naturally start to prosper in what it is that you're meant to do. So um, I think we need to move away from the idea of materialism. That's where it really starts. Until we change our values, you know, we'll never progress. And um, thankfully, it seems like there is a consciousness that is growing, not just nationwide, but across the world. So, you know, the future's open. Um, yeah. It's looking really hopeful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So people getting connected with you guys and what's going on uh, locally. How can people become a part? And who's? If somebody says, "Well, if I want to," you know, I, I just want to be connected. I want to get down. How do they do that? On Instagram is Black Lives underscore Create. Um, we, have, we will be having a phone number and our website's up in the works. But we are moving as well as our email is Black Lives Create at gmail dot com. Again, the Instagram is Black Lives underscore Create, but the email is Black Lives Create at gmail.com and we also have our own personal pages that are affiliated with the instagram so you'll see that if that's confusing too just hashtag black lives create again mm-hmm. we're creating a hub for affiliate um and people who desire to do a free service with whatever it is that they facilitate or their service um, we have a couple people signed up already classes are going to start next week and we'll be promoting it in uh, next week's call city news yeah call city times newspaper and we're looking for other newspapers and things to be able to spread and promote that information out so, yes, we All just, right. uh, well, we we're going to take everywhere. <laughs> well, we're going to be look, we're going to be looking for you. And so looking to see all of you. And so certainly uh, thank you, Brianna. Thank you, uh, Sierra and Doran, for being with us here. They are the co-founders of Black Lives Create. And of course, you've got the information at the bottom of the screen as to how to stay connected to them. We want you to stay connected. Listen, we got more show coming up. We'll be right back right after this.
Well, families and community members of the Bronx walked in protest in solidarity with black people who suffer from racial inequality as well as demanding justice for black lives that were lost to police brutality. Our Bronx that reporter Ashley Tiffany brings us the story right now. Black lives, black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Organizer of the Bronx Walk, Crystal Smith, says she wanted to create this walk for families to develop solutions for black youth and continue the movement for equality. I made it a family event because I have a nephew who's eight years old and I've been out here protesting against police brutality since I was in my teens and 20s and it frustrates me now to be almost 40 years old and I'm back out here protesting for the same things again. And now I have a, a little person in my family that I'm deeply concerned about. He's a sweet kid. I want him to grow up in a world that respects him the same way he's being taught. Bronx-based artist Lust spoke to Bronxnet about the importance of unity between communities. Lust says the Hispanic community needs to show up and stick up for the black community. When, when, when things were going on with Junior, he was a young Dominican man from the Bronx. Everybody was there, you know what I'm saying? So like now a black man gets killed, we need that same energy too. Like everyone has to be there. We can't just pick and choose what battles we want to fight. Like if we're really trying to make change, we have to do all this together. Malcolm, a protester at the walk, voiced his opinion about circulating money within the black community and called on white protesters to take action. I see a lot of white people out here. We thank you for being out here. But remember, you have privilege. You have privilege over everyone in America. So what that means is, if you don't agree with racism, that's great. We salute you. We need to talk to your racist aunt, your racist uncle, your racist cousin. Anybody. As we approach New York primary election day, Crystal reminds protesters to do their diligence, not only by protesting, but by voting as well. Plain and simple, it's about equal accountability for civilians and the police alike. Don't politicize this. Stay focused. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Reporting for BronxNet, Ashley Tiffany. And thank you, Ashley. Well, as the nation continues in its third week of protests over the killing of George Floyd, many people, including teens and adults, have actually moved to the forefront of the demonstration and other protests across this region. They are demanding a few things, an end to police brutality, criminal justice reform, and an end to racism. Many youths are tired of the protests falling on deaf ears, so they're utilizing very different approaches. One group has actually introduced an economic boycott aimed at creating an economic dent so the lawmakers are able to create leg legislation and deal with the matters at hand, ensuring protection for the people of the African diaspora in our country. Here now to pervert, I should say provide better insight uh, is the founder of Buy Black 30, and we've got Darissa White, as also social workers and organizers of the Buy Black 30, Kiara Mallet and Brian Kadeem, and we welcome you now to the show, and uh, good to have the three of you back. Thank you. Good to be Thank back. You. Thank, you. Thank you for having me. Good, good. Well, we saw you on a couple of other platforms, but I'm glad to have you here sharing with us as we talk about this issue. And um, I want to, first of all, you know, talk about as we look at the death of George Floyd and what rises up in you uh, after seeing such a horrific video and literally a death on video, what really rises up in you as an activist? I mean, for me, I am angry. I'm frustrated. I, as a black woman, I feel helpless. I feel like I can't do anything. Um, and that was the basis of this movement. It's an economic protest. It is an economic boycott. We are going to go where we are appreciated, where we are valued. Um, you know, people can post on social media all day long, right? But if you're not really putting your money where your mouth is, it is a moot point. Brian, talk to us a little bit about the work. Uh, economic impact, really huge. Um, so talk to us about how you're looking to make an economic impact and address these disparities. Um, so as we spoke about it before, that um, the only time you really see change in America is through blood and money. And, um, and I think that since we're the ones who are dying, we see the blood part. And um, due to uh, like all the things that's been happening, you know, Darissa led this movement because we just started talking about our research and the boy, uh, Montgomery boycott. 
and it was like up to like 65 percent of their income was depleted because of the boycott and i think that right now this is a chance for everyone or black people to use their voices and uh get their worth and um it's pretty interesting how like in all industries uh this is really a topic on social media the fact that that no, women are not getting paid enough um uh, models are not getting paid enough you know news reporters are not getting paid enough like in i think this is the moment since uh really big corporate white corporations are afraid of losing they're afraid of losing our money they understand that i we have value and when we use our value change really happens and it's interesting to see how um even san francisco literally just started the reform police reform with you utilizing citizens to uh, respond to non-criminal calls. So it's just interesting to see how, like, we know that money is real. Money makes it happen. And, and it's interesting to see how um, that's when things really do change. And um, it's a, they're having a decline. They're having a decline with Black support. And it's so wild that a lot of uh, corporations are are reaching out to keep that black dollar, like to keep that black dollar. They're like making Black Lives Matter statements and they really don't really value us like Darissa said. And I think that the fact that we're, with our movement, we're valuing ourselves as well as making, uh, dismantling all the stigmas associated with black supporters and black, and black supporting each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what matters the most right now is the fact that we are creating new relationships with black consumers and black customers. And yeah. we're just dismantling all the stigmas associated with black supporting black people supporting each other. And change is really happening right now. Like there's a there's an uproar as far as like finances with company with black companies. They they're really making a lot of money right now. And I just we just hope with our movement that it's just consistent and it's uh a, a lifestyle change. Yeah. Akira, we see a lot of businesses and corporations, they're literally <laughs> running for their lives, saving their lives, uh, because they recognize that uh, in order to really align with what's going on today, they're going to have to make a stand and they're going to have to make a statement. Um, and for some, there's some genuine, uh, you know, there's some genuineness uh, in it. Uh, and for others, uh, you can almost, we all see right through it. Um, but talk to us about how we're going to do this in our community in terms of making that adjustment, making that economic investment, and also divesting uh, from people who aren't really supportive. Wow, that's an awesome question. And the, the first way we have to start is by being intentional. We have to plan it through. So, you know, Darissa came up with this wonderful four-step plan so that it's not like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Where am I going to get, where am I going to get my clothes? Where am I going to get my streaming? Where am I going to get my food? You know, so the the great thing about the challenge is that it helps people plan ahead of time. It's like, oh, okay, well, I know that, hey, for me, I'm having a birthday shoot for my birthday at the end of the month. So instead of just waiting to the last minute to go to the mall, it's being conscious about it. Like, okay, well, let me seek out these awesome black fashion designers and then let me invest right because it may be it may be a little bit more expensive but let me be able to invest so that that black business can hire maybe more black employees right and maybe put more money into that community that they are in so it's, it's it may be a little bumpy initially but once we change the way that we think we have to change our process right and once we plan for it it's going to be a success so we're in week three okay and I'm already making major changes. So I was like, uh, we went to go get some food and I was like, oh, is that black owned? <laughs> you know, uh -huh. you know this black owned restaurant, you know, it is fire. You know, so it's having that conversation, especially like with my colleagues, you know, we go get coffee all the time. I'm sorry, but I don't think that the Starbucks campaign was genuine. Um, I think that we can go into people's track records, right? Because we got the internet, we have history and we can go into a company's track record and say, oh, well this, just two years ago, wasn't the police called on two black men in your store? Mm -hmm. And then you closed down your whole stores for the whole nation, right? And now we're here. So, so that's a history, right? And, mm -hmm. and we black folks, we need to remember that history and not be so quick to say, oh, well, let me, it's, it's convenient, right? Because it's really convenient for me to go to Starbucks, put it on my app. They have it at, at the door for me. I don't even have to talk to them, right? It's really convenient. But I can also go to this black coffee shop 
right? I can make an effort to leave five minutes earlier so that I can support. Right. No, you just blew up my whole spot about Starbucks, but I'm gonna come back to that later on. That's ah, all right. <laughs> Let me just go to Darissa now and maybe Darissa go. So listen, you've got this four point plan. So share a little bit about the plan so that people can understand how they can really support their own. Absolutely. So the there's four phases, right? We don't want to overwhelm people with going cold turkey on mainstream buying. We don't want you to just say, you know what, I'm no longer you know, buying from Walmart. I'm no longer buying from Target because we understand that that's unrealistic. You know what I mean? Some things you absolutely need to get from bigger corporations to buy black first, right? And when you think about it, buying black is an afterthought in a lot of cases. We don't really consider that. We always consider going to Rite Aid down the street or to Kiara's point, going to Starbucks or, or wherever the case is. But if you actually go and do the work and research these, you know, these black owned businesses, they're everywhere. So the first phase is really just the most simple. It's just cutting out non-black owned eateries and restaurants. That's it. Um, and that's also followed by grocery stores cutting those out, replacing them with minority owned grocery stores, because I, we know that black people do not have access to the food chain like that. So minority owned business stores like Muslim, I mean, uh, grocery stores like Muslim or Latin. Uh, the second phase is, let me pull it up. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the second phase, it, I mean, Kara, you can feel free to jump in too. Yeah, the second phase is um, the fashion point of it. So not shopping at any non-Black retails, which for me, listen, it has been fascinating shopping Black, okay? Because it very, the models look like me, okay? I'm, I'm you know, curvy, and it was, it's been beautiful. It's been beautiful. The third phase is what we're on right now, and it is very challenging Okay, that is the streaming source. It's very challenging. Right. And Darissa can finish up with the fourth one. A, a lot of people, we were just, we were talking about in our group chat, we have like a team group chat. And when the third phase came on Monday, we were all like, oh, which one are we going to cut out, y'all? But it's like, you have, like, let's just do it, you know? Look at these companies. Less than 4%, less than 4% are Black employed, are Black employed. Netflix is not Black employed iTunes is not black employed. You know what I mean? So if you think about it, let's spend our money where there are black employees and there mm -hmm. are representation. So, I mean, I, I'm removing my Netflix today. I removed Spotify already. Really? I did. I did. Yeah, I, did I did iTunes, which is, oh, I have some <laughs> good playlists. Right. It's hard. <laughs> and so you replaced it with what? You want to be with Tidal, you can replace Tidal. it with Tidal. Tidal is a black-owned streaming service for music. Uh, Quibbly is a net. It's kind of like a Netflix alternative. Own. It's similar to a Netflix alternative. Um, there's there's places there's things out there that you can replace it with, and we're gonna post on the page. We're actually posting today what you can replace these services with. Um, it's, the it's also really quickly, not to cut you off, Darissa, but we want people to start doing more education, more research too. So, you know, it's good to turn off Hulu or Netflix for a little bit and put, pick up a book and learn something more about our history. Exactly. Right. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me jump over to Brian right quick because I want to talk about that mental component, right? Because when you talk about shifting out and doing that, that takes a great deal of, of emotion and it also takes a great deal of mental. So give us about the mental shift that has to occur in order to be able to do this. Um, I think for me right now, uh, I think, uh, last time we talked about this, we talked about, um, black folk actually going to therapy. So if changing your lifestyle right now is a very uh, cultural shock for you, like with buying black, I think that there is a, a magnitude of free therapy services that you can, you know, start with because the streaming part, you see, I was quiet. That's, that's look. <laughs> That's hard. I am a music person. I need to have access to all music at all times. So I have a plethora of them. I have Tidal, I have Spotify, you know, just, you know, I need to have access to, for music. But, um, but I don't need to go to a Walmart and I damn sure don't need to go to Starbucks at all. Uh, it's black coffee shops around me. And, um, but I do think, again, it, it can start with like just having the patience and the, 
the know-how, like right now, utilize resources like Buy Black 30 in order to, to give you that, uh, that, that head start with this process. It's very, this is really hard and it's a very uh, strenuous in, on the mind. I think um, there was moments I was so angry and, you know, shed a few tears, you know, throughout this process the last couple of weeks because we're, we're taking a stand. So I think that if, if you're really serious about this, you will have some like withdrawals and um, it, it will play on your mind. So I think uh, having access to uh, relationships where, where you can have these very uncomfortable conversations, also having access to resources and utilize those resources, DM us, email us. Um, and if you see some free services for like mental health services, just try it out. And I also tell my friends be due to the fact that I'm in mental health, I let I'm gonna try six sessions with you to see if we can do long-term care. And one of my friends, Darissa, can tell you that she used that and that develop, developed a very good relationship, uh, starting relationship with her current therapist. So um, like we just have to have the ability to like utilize the resources because the resources are here and search for the resources and, um, and really process the fear we have with utilizing the resources because change is extremely hard. It's so hard. No lie, I, I almost, like, I love Starbucks, but I dislike them very well, too. And I'm not right. going there no time soon. So I think that um, there's this thing that we have called Black integrity. And it's so weird that me and Darissa, we really talk about Black integrity all the time. It's just this different level of consciousness where you will not allow things to um, disrespect your Blackness first. And that's just what it is. So I have black integrity. You won't see me at no damn Starbucks no time soon. <laughs> All right. Me well, we either. Got, yeah. yeah. Me too. I'm not going to listen. All right. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to say, yes, you're right. Starbucks is definitely uh, one of those people that needs to be called into accountability. Got to leave it there, guys. Thank you so much for uh, sharing with us. Listen, we've got the information at the bottom of the screen. Uh, by Black 30, how you can stay connected. Definitely check them out on the social media platforms. Thank you guys for sharing with us here uh, on the show. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, listen. Well, we'll let you know we come to the end of our show today. Definitely, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this week's discussion as we talk about social justice and anti-violence. And as you found out, social justice is not just about literally police brutality. There's economic, there's, you know, there's housing, there's all these other components, there's education, right? These are all a part of social justice. So you'll continue to see those things happening here on the show. So if you missed any part of the show, listen, Stay connected to us. You can get the recable cast and then also check us back out next Thursday for a brand new episode of Social Justice and Anti Violence Forums. Listen, for all of us, I'm Darren Jaime. Thanks for watching. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. God bless.